Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Akshay Kumari, Research Scholar, Department of Electronics, Mangalore University. We are provided the YouTube live stream link to join international webinar on nanomaterials and flexible electronics to the participants. If you have any questions or queries during the presentation, please type them into the chat box in your YouTube control panel. We will bring them up at the end of the presentation. Now further, without further delay, we will start the inaugural ceremony of the international webinar. Now I would like to invite Professor Navin Kumar SK, convener of the program to welcome the gather. Over to you, sir.
ओके थैंक यू अक्षय थैंक यू अक्षय वेरी वेरी गुड मॉर्निंग वन टू वन एंड ऑल एंड ऑल प्रेजेंट हियर एंड थैंक यू फॉर जॉइनिंग अस टुडे ऑन द इंटरनेशनल वेबिनार ऑन नैनो मटेरियल्स एंड फ्लेक्सिबल इलेक्ट्रॉनिक्स दिस इंटरनेशनल वेबिनार फोकस ऑन द रैपिडली ब्लॉजमिंग फील्ड ऑफ फ्लेक्सिबल इलेक्ट्रॉनिक्स विथ especially particularly focus on the use of nanotechnology to facilitate the flexible electronic materials which processes devices and systems this the invited talks in this webinar covers the significant aspects of the current uh, research area such as carbon nanomaterial heterostructure for solar cell applications biosensors and internet of things in variable health care application flexible electrochemical technology and sensors and super capacitors artificial artificial intelligence and guided nano material for drug delivery application in this occasion i welcome all the speakers and guests of honor who have come here to share their knowledge and vast experience in their respective field with all particulars who joined from all over the country it's my honor to welcome the chief patron professor supramanya edpaditaya honorable vice chancellor mangalore university professor supramanya edpaditaya is is a serving is a serving as the ninth vice chancellor of mangalore university he has obtained phd degree from mangalore university in the area of consumer behavior he did this post doctoral research at natangam business school Nottingham Trent University England under the Commonwealth fellowship scheme he worked as a professor trainer consultant at National Institute of Training for Industrial Engineering Mumbai he published numerous research paper in national and international journal and successfully guided 21 phd students scholars in the area of human resources management he received an international award entitled e learn international award 2003 from scotland uk for his best research paper on trends and status of corporate e learning and indian experience and also re received prestigious divang mehta national award for the best best uh, teacher in human resource management he worked as a finance officer registrar evaluation and register of mangalore university welcome you sir it's my honor to welcome the chief guest of this uh, international webinar professor sabu thomas vice chancellor vice chancellor professor sabu thomas is serving as the vice chancellor of mahatma gandhi university he was the pro chancellor pro vice chancellor director of school of chemical sciences honorable doctor director of international and inter university center for nano science and nano technology of mahatma gandhi university his research areas include polymer nano composites and cellulose nano composites he has received numerous honorary doctorate from various international university and won numerous award he have h index of 100 more than the thousands of publications citations are more than 54298 and he holds 16 patents yes author numerous books and editor for various journals he has guided more than 100 phd students he proud to say and completed more than 40 projects with funds around 30 crores cited in the list of most productive research in india and stands in fifth position in 2008 listed in the most cited researchers in material science and engineering by elsewhere scopus data 2016 welcome you sir it is my thank you so much thank you intended, intended to pressure uh, to welcome the patron sri k raju magavira registrar mangalore university i am delighted to welcome you all the resource from resource person from different parts of the world especially dr rini fernandez nafok state university usa pramod mahajan uh, m rajanna alto university finland Dr. Libu Majakal, Majakal, University of Glasgow. Dr. Vivek Gatte, IAS India, and Dr. B. M. Kumar, Pondicherry Technical University, India. 
also welcome co convener abdul k parchur medical research fellow medical college of wisconsin usa and i also especially welcome uh, our uh, my research scholar akshay kumar he work hard to success uh, of this uh, international uh, webinar last but not least welcome all the participants of today international webinar on nano material and flexible electronics now i would like to invite chief patron professor p subramanya adipadi taya honorable vice chancellor magnus city to inaugurate the international webinar on nano materials and flexible electronics over to you sir university at mangalore is a premier research institute in india and is known for its rich scientific background based on the institutional h index mangalore university received grant from the department of science and technology dst government of india for the development of research infrastructure the mangalore university has greetings from mangalore university happy innovations day to each and every one of you a uh, esteemed guest of honor professor sabu thomas the vice chancellor mahatma gandhi university kottayam who has got great love and affection for mangalore university patron shri k raju magavira ks the registrar of our university convener of this today international webinar on nano materials and flexible electronics professor navin kumar sk co convener dr abdul k parchar from united states of america distinguished resource persons were the participants i am extremely delighted to inaugurate this international webinar on nano materials and flexible electronics today and tomorrow the mangalore university at mangalore is a premier research institute in india and is known for its rich scientific background based on the institutional h index mangalore university received grant from the department of science and technology dst government of india for the development of research infrastructure the mangalore university has established a laboratory as a central facility for pers under this grant and offers a large number of uh, characterization facilities such as xrd lcms fesm eds tga dta or dsc uv vas spectrophotometer laser particle analyzer and so on and so forth along with these facilities it provides a suitable and healthy atmosphere to pursue the research mangalore university has constant endeavor towards research excellence and remains committed to further enhanced performance in science and technology areas research in any field or discipline at the university is conducted keeping in mind the latest developments across the world we have research development consultancy and patent cell with seven verticals in mangalore university namely research publications development consultancy research projects office of research integrity ore and the patent and ipr flexibility is a major breakthrough in the world of electronics which will enable a new paradigm in design and functionality for the de devices which our modern lives depend upon flexible devices have already begun to make their way into the commercial realm and the next few years are bound to see huge changes brought on by this additional dimension which is now available to electronics manufacturers in india and abroad research on flexible electronics has grown exponentially over the last decade 
researchers around the globe are developing a wide range of flexible systems including displays, sensors, RFID tags and other similar devices. Innovations in materials have been key to the increased research success in this field of research in recent years. Transistors, interconnects, memory cells, passive components and other assorted devices all have challenging material demands for flexible electronics to become a reality. Nanomaterials of various kinds have been found to represent a tremendously powerful tool with nanoparticles, nanotubes, uh, nanowires and engineered organic molecules contributing to the realization of high performance semiconductors, dielectrics and conductors for flexible electronics applications. Nanomaterials offer tunability in terms of performance, solution processability and processing temperature requirements which make them very attractive as building blocks for flexible electronic systems. Indeed, such systems represent some of the largest families of commercially produced nanomaterials today and numerous commercial products based on nanoparticle formulations are widely available. As flexible electronic systems move rapidly towards successful commercial deployment, it is extremely likely that they will exploit nanomaterials as building blocks. Developments in the field will help to leverage the power of these materials to realize novel functionalities in flexible form factors. This special international webinar on nanomaterials and flexible electronics to be held on today and tomorrow provide uh, what you call a view of the state of the art in these technologies and gives a vision of the coming innovations that will make flexible electronics a reality. So I wish this international webinar a grand success and this international webinar will not only create heat but also light in the form of uh, deliberations and meaningful and effective discussions. I wish you all the best and I also congratulate the organizers of this uh, international webinar, especially Professor Navin Kumar SK and his team. Thank you very much for your time and opportunity. Greetings from Mangalore University. Thank you, sir. Now I would like to invite our chief guest, Professor Sabu Thomas, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Mahatma Gandhi University to address the gather. Over to you, sir. Very good morning to all of you. And I wish you all the best for the International Conference on Nanomaterials and Flexible Electronics. Uh, respected Vice Chancellor of the University, Mangro University, uh, Professor uh, Subramania Eriplitaya, the Registrar of the University, Professor Raju, the dynamic convener of the conference, Professor Navin Kumar, all the distinguished delegates from different parts of the world, faculty members, students, and my dear friends. Let me first wish you all the best for the conference. Personally, I like conference and meetings. Conference and meetings always give us an opportunity to understand the latest advancement in the subject. I remember when I was a visiting fellow back in 87, 89 in, uh, in Canada, my collaborator used to go for all the ACS meetings. And he told me, Sabu, if you go for ACS meeting every year, you understand the latest advancement in the subject. Therefore, conferences always provide lots of opportunities to listen to the leading people across the globe. And that will also give you lots of benefits to collaborate, to network. See, if you look at my own domain, 
nanomaterials, nanocomposites, green composites. We organize, my group organized at least five to six international meetings every year. Therefore, you name any country in the world, I have at least 10, 15 strong academics as my collaborators, as my great friends. Therefore, I request all of you to be very active in all the sessions. You know, ask questions, discuss with the speakers, understand the latest advancements, and try to, you know, sort of network with them. You know, nanomaterials play a dominant role today. Nano for health is a big area. Nano for medicine. Nano for energy. Nano for electronics. Nano for environment. Nanotechnology for water purification. Nanotechnology for air purification. So nanotechnology plays a very big role now. I really love the, love the content of the conference. My own group, I'm going to show you a, a few slides about my own work on nano for flexible electronics. So I wish all the best for the conference. And I, I really hope that the deliberation of the conference will be extremely useful for you to collaborate, for you to network, for you to understand the latest advancements. So I wish all success and all the best for the conference. And I hope that Professor Navin Kumar will organize a series of meetings for Mangalore University. And your respected vice chancellor said, Mangalore University is doing extremely well. You could tap a lot of funding from Government of India, DST, and other agencies. So keep up this tempo, and I wish you good success for the conference. I'm going to show you a few slides, if you permit me. I'm going to show you a few slides about my own work on flexible electronics. Can I show you a few slides, Dr. Naveen? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. You show. Yes. 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 Just a minute. It's okay, sir. Yeah, I'm going to share. Yeah, it's good. So the title of my presentation today is, uh, can you all see my slide? Yes, sir, we are seeing this. Yeah, it's good. It's the good. title of my presentation is Elastomer Nanocomposites, Sensates in Flexible Electronics. I would like to appreciate the contribution of Professor Kishore Kumar, my former co-worker, now is a professor in uh, Qatar. Dibalashmi Ponamma, she's also a professor in Qatar. Both of them left my, uh, my group uh, a few years ago and both of them got faculty positions and they got married. Kishore is from Andhra and uh, I mean, uh, Dibalashmi is from Kerala. They met in our laboratory and they did fantastic work. And I'm still very active in uh, Nano Center. I'm very active in uh, chemistry. And recently, we started a new school, School of Energy Materials. And I'm the direct, honorary director of the center. My first slide indicates a small, about the summary of my presentation, a small introduction. I will talk about the objectives. How we fabricate these flexible electronic materials. And then I will show you some of my results and summary. The main objective of, of the present, today's presentation is to send you before new elastomeric materials, new rubbery materials for flexible electronics. And I will show you how the mechanism of these flex, uh, flexible materials, how they really operate, how they really sense different properties. That is the main objective of this presentation. You know, elastomers are extremely flexible. Kerala produces lots of fantastic natural rubber, a very flexible material you can stretch to very high elongation. And we have many, many synthetic polymers, synthetic rubbish, butyl rubber, polyvinyl rubber, they're all fantastic materials. So elastomers have a very, very unique property of high elasticity. You can stretch them to very high elongation. That is a main important property for elastomers. Conductive, you, you normally elastomers are not conductive to electricity. But you can you can make them conductive. How do you do that? You add conductive fillets. 
you are carbon nanotube, you are graphene, you are metal particles, you can make them conductive. Once you make them conductive, you can fabricate fantastic material for sensing. You can fabricate fantastic material for electrostatic discharge. You can make fantastic material for EMI shielding. You can make fantastic material for lightning strike protection. So you can make a series of new materials once you make them conductive. Look at the data here. Natural level latex has been used for uh, for uh, uh, conductive applications by adding uh, reduced graphene oxide, thermally reduced graphene oxide. Thermoplastic polyurethane has been made thermally uh, has been made conductive by by adding graphene. So you look at a series of you can have fantastic references. If you look at the literature, people across the globe did fantastic work adding conductive materials into elastomates to make beautiful devices for flexible electronics. I'm showing you some of the nice pictures of uh, flexible electronics done by University of Tokyo, uh, polymer division in Dresden, uh, poly IC in the um, United Kingdom. There are lots of activity across the globe on the use of elastomates for flexible electronics. Now let me show you one of the important fillers being used. Carbon nanotube is a very important filler. Your respected vice chancellor talked about it. Your respected convener talked about it. Carbon nanotube is a very interesting material. Reduced graphene oxide is a very interesting material. Polyanilene is a very important material. You might ask why we are using graphene. Graphene has a lot of good chemical stability, good thermal stability, high specific surface area, excellent mechanics, very good electrical properties, high thermal and gas impermeability. It's a fantastic material, graphene. So we have made use of graphene for, uh, for manufacturing flexible electronics. You know, how did we do this? How did we manufacture graphene? My PhD students bought graphite. It's very cheap. Our pencil is made of graphite. So we bought graphite. We went for oxidation process using Humboldt's loop. We made graphene oxide. And then we made, made a thermal shock, transformed into which reduced graphene oxide by thermal shock at different temperatures. So we, are, we have made reduced graphene oxide 100 degrees Celsius, thermal shock at 100 degrees Celsius, thermal shock at 200 degrees Celsius, thermal shock at 300 degrees Celsius. Thermal shock at 500 degrees Celsius. So my PhD students made reduced graphene oxide at different conditions. I will skip this. You know, how did we manufacture this? Uh, I mean, these uh, flexible electronic materials by two ways, by casting process, by solution casting process. You know, you dissolve the rubber and filler in a suitable solvent and you remove the solvent evaporation process. You can also do by freeze drying process. My PhD students do a lot of freeze drying. You can also do by mechanical mixing process. So three processing protocols are being used in our study. You might ask, what is the mechanism of action? You see, look at this slide. Electrical conductivity has been made use of. Once you add filler into elastomeres, if you are above the percolation threshold, these filler particles, these conductive filler particles form a beautiful network. Once the network is produced, the rubber becomes conductive. Then you can use it for a variety of applications. You can use it for sensing. You can all look at this slide. You see, just tap on this rubber. This is a piece of rubber. You're putting nanofill layers. You just tap on the rubber. When you tap on the rubber, you just tap on, you press the rubber, it forms a network. When it forms a network, you can have a, you can beautiful, the system become conductive. When the network is destroyed, you see resistance goes up. So this is a philosophy of our work. We have made a variety of materials using natural rubber, using polyisobutylene, using SPR. We have made a variety of sensors. I will show you some slides. You can look at this. This is a piece of natural rubber. We introduce graphene platelets. You just tap on the rubber. When you tap on the rubber, you make a network. When you release the tapping force, 
the network is destroyed. And you see the variation in conductivity. This is the philosophy of our uh, sensing work. I will show you some work we did, uh, I mean, we have published with Kishore. We took IAR rubber, isobutylene isoprene rubber. We are the expander graphite. And we made flexible rubber. You just tap on the rubber, look at the variation of uh, resistivity. You tap on the rubber, you see the resistance varies. You tap on the rubber, you release the tapping force. You tap on the rubber, you release the tapping force. Look at this resistance variation. Similarly, you can also make use of IAR and RGO. You just tap on the rubber. You see the resistance variation. So these are fantastic pressure sensors. So my laboratory has made pressure sensors by adding expander graphite and reduced graphene oxide into flexible rubbers. Flexible rubber, we use this IIR, a synthetic rubber, isobutylene, isoprene rubber. We also made materials for sensing solvent. The earlier slide was pressure sensing. This is for sensing solvent. Look at a strip of rubber. This is actually natural rubber filled with carbon nanotube. It could be filled with uh, uh, graphene or a combination of carbon nanotube and graphene. I will show you the philosophy. Look at this slide. This we are publishing soft matter. Natural rubber with CNT exposed to exposed to toluene. When you put a when you put a drop of solvent into this flexible material, which is filled with CNT, rubber takes a solvent. Once the solvent is inside the rubber, you know what happens? Rubber expands. When the rubber expands, look at this. The connectivity is lost. The network is destroyed, so resistance increases. After some time, the solvent escapes. The solvent will not remain in the rubber. The solvent escapes. Look at the system's cups back. Look at the next one. This is a combination of this is actually a combination of a CND and graphene oxide. Look at this. See, the efficiency is much better. This is again a combination of CND and graphene oxide, but a different graphene oxide. Graphene oxide made at 200 degrees Celsius. You see, we, have, we, we could make fantastic solvents to sense toluene, to, silene, to, 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 to sense silene, to sense benzene, the right of solvent. You might ask how they are different because the hyper, I mean, interaction parameter of the solvent with the flexible rubbers are different. So we are able to sense different solvent by making these fantastic nanocomposite sensors. Let me show you another slide where we have made some devices to make, to sense dual sensing, sensing water and oil. The material we have made use of, uh, made use of our study was spiny. And the polymer we made use of for our study was styrene isoprene, styrene, a very flexible rubber, a triblock of polymer. And we, my PhD students made, uh, he, they made in-situ polymerization of aniline in uh, SIS and they made spiny nanocomposite. And first of all, we are putting this spiny nanocomposite into oil. Look at this. You put this into oil. You have piney and rubber. The rubber likes oil because rubber is non-polar and this oil is non-polar. So look at this. There are three types of senses we have made. All these three senses except oil. Once the rubber takes the oil, what happens to resistance? The network is destroyed. Network of piney network is destroyed. So therefore, there's an increase in resistance. Because there are three formulations we have made. And this is the most sensitive. So we are able to sense oil. So this nanocomposite is able to sense oil. Look at the next slide. We wanted to sense water. You put in water. Rubber doesn't like water. Water is polar. And rubber is non-polar. You know, who is absorbing water? Pani likes water. Pani is polar. Pani takes the water and Pani undergoes some sort of alternation process. 
when it undergoes protonation process, you know what happens? Resistance, resistance decreases. Pine becomes more conductive. Look at the resistance decreases. And we made three formulations, three different formulations. This is the most sensitive one. So we are able to detect oil. We are able to detect water. Now the question arises: suppose you have a mixture of water and oil. Can we detect? Yes, look at this. Last, I mean, uh, data. You are putting into a mixture of oil and water. Our flexible <clears throat> rubber nanocomposite is putting into oil and water. When you put into oil and water, question arises, which is going to diffuse first? Water is small molecule, viscosity is low. So water gets into the system. Water is taken by the pani. What happens? It becomes more conductive because pani is protonated. After a while, the oil starts getting into the system. Look at when oil gets into the system, the rubber expands and the conductivity is destroyed. You see the resistance goes up. So we are able to detect water. We are able to detect resistance. So we have made dual senses, dual phase sensing. I'm going to, I mean, wind up my lecture so. Flexible electronics are extremely important for a large number of applications, making pressure sensors, making smart systems, lightning arrestors, detecting oil leakage, lots of fantastic applications. So I wanted to conclude that my research group could be able to make a large number of flexible elastomeric materials using nanoparticles, graphene, expander graphite, carbon nanotube, Tiny, and we made fantastic sensors for variety of applications. Pressure sensing, you tap on your, uh, you know, you tap on your material, you know, it can act as a beautiful pressure sensor, the way you tap on your uh, mobile. We are discussing with the company to, uh, to make some products. We are able to sense oil and water. We are able to sense different types of solvents. So we, would, we, we could make fantastic senses. We are discussing the different companies to real commercial production. So I, 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 I thank all my collaborators. So we have a large number of students working on this topic, government funding. And particularly, I'm thankful to Professor Sienna Rao for the generous funding of our nano laboratory. International funding, uh, India French program, India Sweden program, India Sweden. I have several international cooperation. Funding from MRF and Apollo tires. Last week, we signed a contract with Apollo tires to make use of cellulose material for uh, tire engineering. And you can see my collaborators in Brazil, India. They're all my collaborators. Now, let me show you this work was partly done. In the laboratory of Yves in France. So this is a photograph with Yves. You see the picture of, uh, I mean, um, uh, Sadashivan Uni, Kishore Kumar Uni, and you can see these two people. They got married. They are now faculty members in Qatar. The Balishmi. Both of them worked very hard on this topic, and we also wrote a very good review in Progress in Polymer Science. You can see my group in chemistry. Please see my group in nanoscience and nanotechnology. We have a very big group in nanoscience and nanotechnology. You can see the our present director, Dr. Nanda Kumar, and we have students from Malaysia, from Africa, from different parts of the world. Welcome to our campus after the pandemic. We can start some joint work. Kerala is very beautiful. God's own country. We have beautiful canals for, uh, uh, I mean, uh, boating. We have houseboard, we have very old temples, as in Karnataka. We have uh, Kathakali, the traditional art of Kerala, Mohiniyattam, the dance of young girls. This is our university campus. And I am organizing an international conference in 100 years of macromolecular science. You know, macromolecular science was formulated by the German Nobel laureate in 1920, So. 100 years are over now, so we are organizing a big international webinar in the campus 11, 12, and 13 of November. So you are all welcome to this meeting. We are also planning a face-to-face -face conference webinar. I hope the pandemic will be over by that time next year, 9 to 11, 2021. So welcome for this meeting too. 
and I'm the editor of nano structures and nano objects. The current size score of the journal is 5.6. So I want to build an impact of 10. So those who do good work in nano structures and nano nano materials, please submit your article to the journal. This is a traditional journal of Elsevier, no page artists. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Thank you, uh, Professor Naveen, for giving me an opportunity. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Professor, for a wonderful uh, talk on flexible electronics, which enlightened us to do research on flexible electronics. In future, we would like to do collaboration work with you. Uh, with your support and guidelines, we have to establish, uh, we would like to establish flexible electronics lab. So mm -hmm. I also invited to, after this panel, uh, to our uh, university, after this uh, COVID uh, situation. Thank you once again, Professor. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Professor Nadine. I wish you all success and all the thank best you, for sir. the conference. You will keep in touch. And also wonderful slides are you have shown. Very good, wonderful slides on flexible electronics. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Once thank you. So, thank uh, you. Uh, I'm, I'm really sorry to interrupt. May I ask a question? Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, hi. Uh, this is uh, Pramod. Uh, uh, and I thank you very much, uh, Professor Sabu Thomas, for a wonderful presentation but i had a very quick question because our areas match quite closely although i am in the i'm, I'm more into the application side uh, including the material synthesis part the quick question i had was uh, since you mentioned a lot about carbon nanotubes and its composites what type of carbon nanotubes would, would you be more interested in or or what is it that you are specifically looking in terms of its parameters and properties that would interest in such kind of composites so thank you, thank you for an interesting question. See, all this work has been done by using multi-volt carbon nanotube. Multi-volt carbon nanotube introduced into polymers. We have used different protocols to mix multi-volt carbon nanotube. You know, carbon nanotubes are very difficult to be dispersed from. Our. So we have also used several protocols to disperse carbon nanotube in rubber. Some cases we have made use of honey some cases we have made use of some sort of covering a nanotube with compatibilizers. So several protocols have been utilized in my laboratory to disperse them in elastomeric materials. We made use of a solution casting process. We made use of latex compounding technique. We also made use of freeze drying and mechanical mixing. So we are really interested uh, working on this topic I mean, uh, on developing a variety of materials. So I'm happy to collaborate with you. Uh, if you're really interested, we can work together and we can develop many materials, conducting materials. Okay. Thank yeah, you. thank you very much. Uh, yeah, in my following talk, I think if I'm going to be the next one we'll be uh, presenting, so maybe if you if you'll have time and you're there yes. during this course. Yes. So yes. because Definitely. I'll be talking a lot on carbon nanotubes. Uh, Excellent. Excellent. And my research on carbon nanotubes. So, uh, yeah, so maybe we can discuss more uh, during sure. the time. But, sure. but, yeah, but I do have some follow up questions, but maybe we can discuss it later. Thank you. Perfect. Much. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Naveen. Thank you. Um, 
Thank you, sir. Now we will move on the first session of the webinar. Uh, dear participants, please note, type your queries and questions uh, into the chat box in your YouTube control panel. And uh, we will bring them up at the end of the presentation. Now, Dr. Navin Kumar SK is the chair of the first session. And Dr. Pramod M. Rajana is a resource person of the session. Professor Navin Kumar SK is a professor and chair at the Department of Electronics, Mangalore University. He received his PhD from University of Mysore. He has published more than 200 papers in international journals and guided seven PhD students and eight currently under him. He has completed three major research projects and he has been working on the Indo-US bilateral research project funded by the University Grant Commission, UGC. He has received numerous awards and authored numerous books and reviews for the various journals. His research area includes nanomaterials, thin film semiconductors, nanoelectronics, nanoscale physics, image processing, biomedical electronics, and Internet of Things. Welcome you, sir. Also, Dr. Pramod M. Rajana is a senior scientist in Micronova and postdoctoral scientist in Alto University, Finland. He completed his PhD from MIT's Kolkova Institute of Science and Technology, Moscow, and DSC from Alto University. He has worked as a research, research scientist from German Aerospace Center, Germany. He has, a, has been visiting scientists in various countries such as Manchester, UK, Estonia, and Japan. His research interest interest in silicon thin films, hydrojunction, optoelectron devices in solar cells, novel functional layers, carbon nanomaterials, and uh, black silicon. Now I would like to invite Dr. F Professor Navin Kumar SK to chair the session. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Akshay. Now I will invite uh, Pramod uh, Mulubagal Rajanna to give a uh, talk on solar, Carbon nanometer heterostructure for solar cell application. Over to Pramod. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Naveen and Akshay. And uh, it's my pleasure. So uh, before I begin, uh, do you want me to have the video because of the street, because of the bandwidth issues, or can I turn it off, or how do you prefer? Okay, it's no problem. We can play video. Okay, good. So um, let me start sharing so are you able to see is it visible yes sir yes 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 Okay, great. Thank you very much. So uh, let me quickly introduce myself. I am Pramod and uh, I am currently working as a senior scientist, as already mentioned, for with, a, with a very nice introduction by Akshay and Naveen. And uh, in, I'm associated with Micronova and Alpha at the moment. So previously, I, my, the work that I will be showing or sh sharing a part of my work today uh, was mainly done in Germany uh, and Finland and in Moscow. Uh, so the title is Carbon Nanomaterials for Heterojunction Photovoltaics. Uh, so carbon nanomaterials can be various types. So it can be fullerenes, it can be graphene, it can be carbon nanotubes. But and why specifically heterojunction and photovoltaics is it's, it's a name for solar cell applications. So before I actually begin into the details, let me quickly tell you uh, from where I come from. For now, so basically from India, I, I live in, I mean, I'm basically from Mysore and uh, I happen to be uh, the master student of uh, Professor Naveen Kumar while he was a uh, professor in uh, University of Mysore where I finished my master's. 
and later on i moved on in several industries and then in several other organizations different parts of the globe and i'm currently working in finland so this is where finland is it's a neighborhood to sweden uh, and norway and uh, this forms the arctic belt um it has a very it's a very thinly populated country so it's about 5.5 million so uh unlike in india we have there is different shades of uh, there is a very distinct difference in the atmosphere so you have the winter which is snowy and then you have the spring you have the um you know beautiful uh you know lakes and there are more than more than 500 lakes which are there and the, one of the most striking part is something called as northern light which is the aurora borealis scientifically called that so which happens mainly in the extreme north of these uh, scandinavian regions so but but in march it's it turns to be very very uh, very snowy very windy and it's it's not an easy time to be there during that while and uh, uh, quickly on the place where i graduated from so uh, all the university of technology it was in the top 50 technical universities in the world uh, and then they club the business school and also the economic school into the technical school and it was later in 2010 it was formed as uh as the university uh, it has it, it has it has a very international background it is also located very close i mean at the banks of the sea so it's kind of widely spread throughout the city and more into the research center where i come basically and employed uh, is micronova and btd technical research center uh, so it's called micronova so we have uh, class 10 and class 100 clean rooms uh, with, with with an area of 2600 square meters and uh, we have lot of uh, fab fab processes for semiconductor devices from transistors to sensors to uh, solar cells uh basically crystalline and we work from uh, 2 inch up to 8 inch wafers so this is what we we basically work with and this is how the outline looks like the fab uh, so we have different kinds of setups and dedicated uh, areas for each of these processes and uh, more importantly uh, finland is very famous for the invention of atomic layer deposition so it was in this place that alv was also invented so we have the parent organizations of benek and bicosan which is housed here in our uh, building and uh, we work with them very closely for the, for technical support and uh, other purposes so moving on to the outline i'll just briefly give you a short introduction and the motivation behind the work and uh, as i mentioned i'll be mainly talk on talking on this carbon nanotube single wall carbon nanotube thin films Uh, among all the carbon and materials and the fabrication process and we have had a fantastic journey in the last 4 years moving from uh, close to 1% to nearly 9% uh, output efficiencies and some final conclusions so this this is the carbon and materials family so this is how the crystal structure looks like uh, so fullerene has been very well studied very well uh, it's one probably one of the most applied research materials in 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 optoelectronic devices and then these are carbon nanotube and na nanotubes and then the graphene which which has been in focus within the last two decades uh, so i'll be mainly focusing on the nanotubes and more specifically on uh, single wall carbon nanotubes these are one dimensional structures which can be like single wall double wall or multi wall so single wall is you have a single uh, cylinder so you it just simply imagine you have a sheet of graphene and you roll it in a specific direction so you, depending on the angle that you that you uh, roll you can have single wall double wall or multi wall here in the in the uh, adjacent picture what you see is a multi wall carbon nanotubes Uh, so carbon nanotubes have been in the history ever since the evolution of mankind or probably ever since the evolution of this universe so if we carefully look at how the nature and here are some of the some of the core links if you are interested to go through how the carbon nanotubes have been there ever since the evolution of this universe i mean including in 250 million years ago so and and lately in the last in the last uh, decade and a half the carbon nanotubes 
application and its market share has tremendously been increasing and uh, what has been uh, you know calculated or speculated is by 2040 we will have an output compounded annual growth rate of greater than 22 percent which is spectacular considering that uh, the silicon is the one which rules the market currently but i think the carbon nanotubes are going to be very much on par with the silicon in the uh, so if you look carefully, the carbon nanomaterials can be applied in different kinds of applications from sensors to solar cells to triodes to detectors to electrochemical cells to optical modulators. And uh, more importantly, the carbon nanotubes, uh, which I'll be focusing for applications in energy called solar cell applications or photovoltaics. So the ca carbon based uh, solar cells have been there ever since 1960s. But I think in, from 1950s, it has been uh, nine. So to just give a short background, you know, carbon nanotubes was first found in 1952. But then due to the uh, non-advancement of the technological, uh, you know, experimental or, or uh, characterization techniques. So I, I think in 91, Sumio Ijima, who, uh, who was who published his paper in Nature, was uh, has been credited as one of the main uh, persons who report who happened to report the invention of single wall carbon nanotubes but nevertheless i mean if you look from 1980s uh, it has been very much slow growth but i think in from nine after 91 around this time it's when the carbon nanotube applications really picked up and uh, we see that in 2015 uh, it was about 16 percent as an efficiency output so when I, whenever i talk about output efficiency it's always the incident sunlight which we uh, which is about uh, 1000 watt per square meter and what the device is able to produce outside uh, after the absorption the generation of electron hole pairs and and, and the collection processes so if we, so what has been already uh, now a lot of focus in the industry is the carbon nanotube silicon crystalline silicon technology which has been uh, currently the dominant technology so uh, if you look at it since 2008 till 2020 uh, the single wall carbon nanotubes has been has moved steadily from 16 percent to nearly 20 percent so the, the world record for crystalline silicon is 24 percent efficiency but with the infrastructure which consumes very high energy process technology and which is a lot more expensive than what the carbon nanotube silicon uh, solar cells can be produced which can also be flexible in addition and also we have moved from small area devices to larger area devices thereby enabling more electron hole pair collection and generation uh, which could be in a real time application but in spite of all these great advantages though which has moved from 1.4% in 2008 to nearly 19% now uh, the biggest drawback has been the flexibility of the carbon nanotubes which can be really flexible with different radius of curvatures even up to 180 uh, with, while the crystalline silicon tends to have a higher tensile fracture stress so why single wall carbon nanotubes it has a very high charge carrier mobility it has a very strong absorbance in spectral range the band gap can really be cured because all that matters is the diameter of the tube so you increase the diameter the band gap is going to increase you shrink the diameter of the tube the band gap kind of shrinks and you can shift the fermi level uh, uh, through chemical doping and electrical doping it has an excellent environmental stability and it has been in uh, the main contender for replacing the existing transparent conductive oxide which has been dominated by indium tin oxide and fluorine doped tin oxide and while they tend to be n-type uh, tin uh, you know uh, transparent conductors while carbon nanotubes are p-type transparent conductors so in, in in the later part of my lecture you will you will see how the transformation has been in the carbon nanotubes as a, as a contender for transparent electrodes. Additionally, it can be flexible and it can have a larger surface area. And uh, to just give you a snapshot, I mean, here are some um, uh, core numbers which would give you uh, why the carbon nanotubes, uh, single wall carbon nanotubes, are much more advantageous than multi wall. Multi wall uh, ha doesn't have such high ballistic conductance, while the electrical conductance of the carbon nanotubes can be really high and can carry much, much higher current than what the multi volt or the double volt can do. But at the same time, the mechanical properties, the tensile fracture stress of the single volt carbon nanotubes 
uh, uh, compared to be much uh, not as good as multi-wall carbon nanotubes due, due to the superimposition of different walls. And then in this talk, as I mentioned, uh, silicon, the other alternative neighbor of silicon is amorphous silicon, which is basically a thin film silicon uh, material, which can be produced, which can have a much better temperature coefficient than crystalline silicon, which means that at higher temperatures, it, can, it is much more efficient and tolerable. Uh, the band gap can facilitate the near UV or the blue rich light and uh, the amorphous silicon based uh, material, uh, solar cells can be made lightweight, flexible radiation resistance because all it takes is a very low energy consuming process. In fact, even at room temperature, it can be produced. So, as I mentioned, the energy production cost is lower. The amorphous silicon based systems have much lower energy lifetime than the crystalline silicon simply due to the infrastructure that it needs for the crystalline silicon to be produced. And the main goal in the work that I targeted was to develop an energy efficient process which is environmentally friendly and very low cost. So there have been several work and a lot of reports. I've just taken out some of the most important works. And in spite of so much of research in the last three decades on carbon nanotube and amorphous silicon, the efficiencies has been much, much, it's beyond, it's beyond practical applications, which is much less than 10-2%. Uh, it was due to the very poor optoelectrical properties of the carbon nanotubes, very high junction recombination at the interface, which is basically between the carbon nanotube and amorphous silicon. So basically at this interface, and also the high junction resistance within the carbon nanotube itself, because it's not yeah, unidirectional, but it is a multi-directional multi, uh, carbon nanotube, which is like a randomly oriented network. Um, I'll show you in the coming slides, and, and it showed a very poor diode behavior. So these are some of the points which I tried to address during my research. So how do we how do we synthesize the carbon nanotube? So it's something. Uh, it, it's there are a lot of different synthesis techniques. So how we make is using an aerosol CBD. So it's a chemical vapor deposition, aerosol uh, the CVD, where we have the thermal decomposition and disproportion, uh, disproportionation of the CO molecule using the ferrocene cartridge that you have here. And these two act as a carrier gas, and then you pass through this ferrocene cartridge, cartridge which is already at a certain uh, temperature. Uh, and then it is passed through this reactor, uh, which moves from a hot zone to the cold zone. And during this movement with different parameter controls, you have the synthesis of the single wall carbon nanotubes, which then is actually collected on a filter. So if we carefully look, so this, uh, so once we, uh, during the synthesis of the carbon nanotubes happens in the reactor gas so within this chamber. And then once they are there, then we collect them on the filter that you sh I showed you here. And um, the, the thickness of this, so you see from almost six nanometers to nearly three microns. So it, it can be really transparent or completely opaque, like really black, uh, depending on the deposition time. And then you can have these thin films of carbon nanotubes, which can be as low as six nanometers to as high as several microns. And this is what is un unlike the other under uh, carbon nanotubes, which is more solution approach. So this is a thin film technology that we work with. And this is how it actually looks like. So on the, on the left hand side, what you see is the surface morphology of the single wall carbon nanotube, which I mean, it is very similar to uh, a randomly oriented, you know, a spaghetti. And if you, if, you, if you know what a spaghetti is, very similar to a Maggi. Uh, if you jumble them, it's like a jumbled network, and each of these are single wall carbon nanotubes, which are jumbled together in a randomly oriented fashion to form a bundle network. And on the right hand side is what you see is a freestanding carbon nanotube, so which, which has a very woolly kind of a structure. So, and as I mentioned during in the previous slide, there is something called as a dry deposition. Unlike we don't have, we don't need any high temperature or any specific vacuum conditions that needs to uh, that needs to be there. So, how we basically do is is as in this uh, video. Let me try to play it and for some reason. Okay, uh, it's quite unfortunate. So all we basically do is, so we have this, so what you see, uh, I, I'm trying to show you from my pointer 
is uh, this filter paper that is there on which we collect the carbon nanotubes and then we transfer them on any given uh, substrate uh, just by pressing unfortunately i'm not able to it is not playing here but for some reason uh, so uh, using this filter the carbon nanotubes which are there you transfer them to any on any substrate for example glass silicon wafer ito or any kind of a polymer, you just press them or roll them uniformly. Then the, the nanotubes, which form basically the grape shades or the black shades, they get transferred onto the substrate, and then it, that, that's how it looks like. Uh, okay. Uh, so, but when we transfer them, it's very important to see what is the adhesion of these carbon nanotubes onto any given substrate. So, what I did was. Uh, so we pass the uh, we pass these uh, carbon nanotubes and transfer them onto different substrates. For example, a glass on a textured aluminum zinc oxide and a polished monocrystalline wafer, unpolished crystalline wafer which is textured and ITO, flat aluminum zinc oxide and zirconia. And we see that on some of the materials when we try to transfer the carbon nanotubes, they easily get transferred, which has been mentioned as pass here. And on some of them, it fails. I mean, it doesn't transfer; it has a repelling behavior. Then I tr we try to understand what is the reason for this and we try to check the surface morphology. It turned out that uh, on, on, the, on, the on the substrate which had the surface roughness of about 10 nanometers, the nanotubes were very adhesive, which, which means that it transferred very easily. But while on a 60 nanometer surface roughness, the carbon nanotubes tend to be non-adhesive. So then it started uh, to click to us is surface roughness is a critical parameter for the adhesion. But then when I exposed, when we exposed these materials which failed to transfer, uh, on which the carbon nanotubes failed to transfer, we exposed them to a passive HF treatment. And then after the passive HF treatment, it turned out that even on a 60 nanometer higher surface roughness uh, substrate, the carbon, uh, the carbon nanotubes were easily transferred. Then the same approach was applied to all the different substrates that I show here. And it happened so that after the HF treatment, the carbon nanotubes easily transferred on each of these substrates. So this started triggering to us, does HF treatment play any role? So what I did was uh, then we transferred these carbon nanotube films uh, to different substrate materials. Uh, I, I, what you see here is the cantilever tips of, of the AFM. So in AFM called atomic force microscopy, so there is a there is a mode called as QNM mode, which is the quantitative nanomechanical mapping. So in which you can have these cantilevers. Uh, so I I used silicon. I deposited zirconium oxide on the cantilever and uh, amorphous silicon ITO PDMS. It's polydimethyl thiosine, so which is flexible. It is a polymer, non-conductive polymer, silicon dioxide, which is basically glass. And then the carbon nanotubes to carbon nanotube adhesion was also checked and then the platinum. So you have a different variety of uh, family of materials from semiconductors to conductors to insulators and the, uh, and the carbon nanotubes. So what we, did, what we did was we brought these cantilevers in the AFM very close to the, very close to the substrate which was transferred with the carbon nanotubes. And then the peak force and different peak forces were applied which was moved from almost five nanonewtons to 200 nanonewtons and then we had these force uh, distance curves and then at the break point we would this is the area where we would calculate the adhesion force and when we would calculate adhesion force for different materials so this experiment was basically done both in air uh, and in absence in in inert atmosphere in a glove box uh, the measurements were done in both air and the and the inert atmosphere and it happened so that in all the cases when the adhesion force was very low in air, but while in inner atmosphere, it was much, much higher, the adhesion of carbon nanotubes. Uh, while on the same experiment, while when it was ex done in air, but treated with HF, the adhesion force improved when compared to the without the HF treatment. So what you basically see is uh, on the left hand side is the adhesion force density which is devoid of the cantilever radius so the, when i say radius is the radius radius of these tips uh, so if we negate the radius of the tip then what you would be calculating uh, seeing is only the adhesion between material to material adhesion so 
When we do this, we clearly see that the adhesion force of the carbon nanotubes is much higher in air, uh, much higher in inert atmosphere, but the adhesion significantly improves uh, in a HF after the HF treatment uh, when when performed in air. So this is the conclusion uh, inference that we would make uh, with this uh, with this uh, study at that the adhesion of the carbon nanotubes completely depends on the atmospheric condition and the surface functionalization of the given substrate. And uh, so using this knowledge, so what I did further was uh, we made a composite of the conductive polymer of P.PSS, uh, which is one of the most commonly used in organic uh, applications, organic optoelectronic devices, and the carbon nanotube. So all we did was we spin caught the P.PSS on the surface of the carbon nanotube, and then what you see on the left hand side is the carbon nanotube without the P.PSS, and what you see on the right hand side is the composite of the P.PSS and uh, carbon nanotube. Uh, where you see that all the micropores and the nanopores which are there uh, in figure A are actually then uh, completely, uh, you know, fill the micropores when, when the speed of PSS is spin coated. And when we check the electrical and the uh, optoelectronic properties of these, uh, of this uh, films, thin films, so we see that the carbon nanotube with increasing thickness, although it has much higher heat resistance, but we lose on the transmittance. Basically, then the absorbance start, starts to increase. But then, when we see uh, that uh, at lower heat at lower transmittance, when we have the carbon nanotubes and the P dot PSS, which is basically the star brown stars. So we see that this tends to also have when, when the P.PSS and the carbon nanotube composites are there, the sheet resistance decreases, which means the electrical conductivity significantly improves. And also while, while the absorbance is kept minimum, so uh, if you would see if, uh, with, with uh, transmittance at 90% in, in the red box, uh, we had a carbon nanotube thickness uh, at 90% of about 20 nanometers with a sheet resistance of uh, uh, very low, very high sheet resistance, but while while the uh, composites of P dot PSS and carbon nanotubes at ninety percent transmittance tends to have about one eighty, so it improves from almost three fifty, which you see here in the star blue star, to nearly two hundred. So with this. Uh, base then the fabrication process tends to begin so the process flow is very simple so we take a glass substrate we uh, uh, sputter the aluminum zinc oxide and then texture with hcl and then we deposit the amorphous silicon n type by plasma cvd at uh, less than 200 degrees c and then the intrinsic uh, amorphous silicon by plasma cvd on and then we dry transfer the carbon nanotubes and then spin coat the p.pss and then we apply on the edges uh, silver paste. So if you see, this is how uh, we, it, it, the structure looks like. So from bottom up, it's the glass, it's the zinc oxide, and it's the intrinsic amorphous, uh, type amorphous silicon, intrinsic amorphous silicon, it is non-dope. And then we have the transfer of the carbon nanotube and the spin coating of the P dot PSS. And then we make these measurements. So we, the, there was three different sets of device that was made. One was a carbon nanotube amorphous silicon. The second was a P dot PSS amorphous silicon. And third was a carbon nanotube polymer composite amorphous silicon. And then we check the, when we look, make the measurements. So we see that the composites of P dot PSS and amorphous uh, of, and carbon nanotubes fare much better in terms of its output. So it has an open circuit voltage of 800 millivolts, a current density of nearly 3.5 and compared to uh, P dot PSS and amorphous silicon and carbon nanotube amorphous silicon with a much higher fill factor. So fill factor is area under this curve. So we see that for the composite it fare better and the efficiency is much higher. So when we check out the quantum efficiency curves, we see again that the saturation of the composite device is much higher than the other two. So this actually can be explained very simply as follows. So the, the carbon nanotubes, as I showed you, it's a randomly oriented network. So when they come in contact with the, with the beneath amorphous silicon, they form a non-uniform contact. But when the P dot PSS is spoon coated, so not only the carbon nanotubes are pushed towards the surface of the amorphous silicon, but also the conductive property of the P dot PSS 
also helps in forming additional heterojunctions thereby when these two are combined together so we see that the the, the holes which uh, the, the the electron hole pairs which are generated in the intrinsic layer due to the electric field then they the holes move tend to move towards the pi interface so here is the p in the blue shaded region and the i is the intrinsic layer so at this interface and the n and the electrons tend to move close to the i n regions or this interface and then uh, the holes which can be collected both by the p dot pss on the carbon nanotubes and due to the higher mobility and carrier lifetimes in carbon nanotubes due to its much higher electrical properties these carbon nanotubes act as a bridge thereby we have this much higher current density and much higher fill factor there and, uh, and uh, improve efficiency and due to the uniform contact we see that the open circuit voltage uh, is much higher than either of them so it, it clearly says that the synergistic effect of the carbon nanotube and p dot pss leads to a better device performance so but in, in spite of all this understanding if we look at this 1.5% of efficiency it's still very low i mean compared to the standard output amorphous silicon industrial process yields about 10% as as the efficiencies in in the market which is available so it was very important to optimize this p dot pss carbon nanotube composites that that is what we addressed so what we did was we we uh, checked we tried to optimize these carbon nanotubes so we had carbon nanotubes from almost 10 uh, for a carbon nanotube with a 20 nanometer uh, thickness when it forms a composite with, with the p dot pss has the highest current density performance and also the most highest saturated current uh, quantum efficiency which is close to 40 percent so we already improved from uh, uh, nearly, uh, if you remember here, from 3.5 percent with this particular thickness to nearly uh, 4 percent, but with a much higher, uh, to nearly 8 milliamperes per square centimeter, with much improved, uh, you know, open circuit voltage and efficiency from 1.5 to 2.7 percent. But although this was there, so it took 2.7%. So we took this particular device of CNT20, which gives the highest current density, and then we spin coated the PMMA, which is basically a non conductive uh, polymer on top of the device. And we see that due to its uh, anti reflective properties, the PMMA tends to uh, reduce the reflectance, thereby increasing the absorption within the device and generation of more electron hole pairs thereby the current density improves from 7.9 to nearly 9 milliamps with the PMMA and the efficiency improves from 2.7 to 3.3 thereby and also the quantum efficiency curve if you look at close to the visible spectrum I mean at the height the peak of the visible spectrum at 550 so we have close to 50, 49 percent so which is much higher than without the PMMA. So with this understanding, we moved already from 1.5 to 3.4, but still it's not good. So what, again, it was important for us to optimize it further. So what we did was, so we made four different types of transparent conductors. So here TCF means transparent conductive film, which is basically P-type transparent conductors. So there was these four different types of transparent conductors made. So in the first one, what we did, we you took the glass, uh, dry transfer the carbon nanotube, spin coat of the P dot PSS, and there was a very noble idea of using the same carbon nanotube films and rolling them up in a specific angle to form very narrow fibers, which has a width of nearly between 20 to 60 micrometers. And so this whole stack formed TCF1, which is basically the carbon nanotube P dot PSS and the fibers, which is TCF1. In TCF2, we use the same approach of the carbon nanotube dry transfer, and then we evaporate an ultra thin layer of molybdenum oxide on top of the carbon nanotube, and then we spin coat the P dot PSS and have the carbon fibers laid. So this whole stack forms the TCF2, and then we have the TCF3, which basically is the same approach. We have the carbon nanotubes on the glass, then we dope the carbon nanotubes by a fluorooric acid, by which is a wet doping or chemical doping and then we repeat the process of uh, you know deposition or a thermal evaporation of ultra thin molyoxide and spit coat of the p dot pss and then we dope the fibers again 
So here, both the film and the fibers, they are doped. So this whole stack forms TCF3. And then in TCF4, everything else remains the same. It's exactly the replica of TCF3. What only changes is the spin coding of the PMMA, which we understood from the previous, uh, you know, the results that we obtained. And then we on TCF4, all we did was we took TCF3 and spin coded the PMMA to form the TCF4. So if you look at the electric optoelectrical properties of these different TCFs, so what we can really see is uh, what needs to be paid attention is to the shaded, the shaded rows. So we have the pristine carbon nanotube film, uh, which is 20 nanometers with a equivalent sheet resistance of 364 ohm per square. And then when we dope these carbon nanotubes with chlorooric acid, so the sheet resistance decreases by almost two times from 364 to 100 ohm per square. And then using the same carbon nanotube film, the fibers have a conductivity. So since it's, it's, it's fiber, so we don't have the, it, it cannot be as a ohm per square, we need to check the conductivity. So if we pay attention to the conductivity values, it increases from 0.15 for a film to 62 Siemens per centimeter. So which is two orders of magnitude. And then for a dope film, which is 0.51 to nearly 100 ohm per 100 Siemens per centimeter by three orders of magnitude. So we would, the difference between the film and the fiber is, is a conductivity range is three orders of magnitude. And then the TCF three and four tends to have the highest, uh, you know, conductivity with uh, 20, nearly 25 Siemens per centimeter. When, uh, as I showed you in the structure previously, when calculated with an equivalent sheet resistance at 90% transparency of 17 ohm per square, which is very close to what the IDO values could be when it is textured. And this is the highest recorded uh, single wall carbon nanotube composite, uh, you know, transparent conductor, which is P-type. So thereby making this as a P-type transparent conductor, which is 17 ohm per square at 90% transparency. So if you look at the optical properties, uh, it's very clearly seen here. So what's the orange dotted lines is the PMMA and the pristine carbon nanotubes. When you look at 550-550 nanometers, it's nearly uh, you know 90 percent. So and then when we have these stacks, the 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 transmitter slowly reduces. But then when we recalculate everything at 550 nanometers, so the, we we have a sheet resistance of 17 ohm per square, and this is how the surface morphology looks like. Uh, you know between from the pristine carbon nanotube, which I showed you previously, to the T, to the TCF stack, which is a stack of P dot PSS, moly oxide, and carbon nanotubes. And this is how it actually looks like. And then I have been, then we check the mechanical properties of these, uh, you know, the whole transparent conductor. So what we did was we, exp we, we, we made about up to 50,000 bending cycles at different radius of curvatures. And then we would see that uh, in spite of in spite of that long bending cycle, the radius of curvature, uh, the sheet, the you know the change in resistance is less than five percent in, in, in at, even at maximum uh, you know radius of curvature. I mean that's what you see here on the left hand side in the photograph below is the is the whole stack of the transparent conductor on a polyimide film, which is very very flexible uh, and. Uh, it, you know, despite despite the fact that we, we change the radius of curvature, the resistance doesn't increase uh, greater than more than five percent. So, using this, uh, you know, the newly developed TCFs. So then we went on to fabricate the device. Uh, so we have the clean glass, and then we repeat the process of sputtering for aluminum zinc oxide as the pack contact and the n-type amorphous silicon intrinsic amorphous silicon and then we have the uh, ultra thin layer of the molybdenum oxide on intrinsic amorphous silicon thereby you know having a higher work function layer at the interface and then we implement the develop tcf1 to tcf4 and this is how the stack looks like so we move from glass substrate to aluminum zinc oxide to n-type amorphous silicon intrinsic moly oxide sorry and then the the, the whole stack and then we do the measurements. So it's a very, the whole process was done, fabrication was done at room temperature, close to room temperature, and it's a very energy efficient process. And there is completely elimination of, uh, you know, silane, diborane, 
um, uh, you know, and uh, the further ITOs that is normally used in the industry. And I have been talking to you a lot about the fibers, the fibers that you see on the top from the film that it is made. So how I, how we make it is we have these carbon tubes which are on a glass substrate. I mean, very, very narrowly. Then there is a drop of uh, EPA, and then at a specific angle, we carefully lift it, and then it in its wet state, we lay it on the device, thereby making this as uh, alternative. Uh, thereby making this as a very simple fabrication process of carbon nanotubes and also due to its very high conductivity i mean i sh i mentioned to you that the conductivity of these fibers are 100 ohm siemens per centimeter so which means that it's 10 power 2 uh, it can be as used an alternative metal contacts to aluminum and copper which could be there this could be very 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 cheap uh, and uh, very easily uh, made uh, and then when we test the performance of the devices, so uh, the JV characteristics, so what you see on the Y axis is the current density and the X axis is the voltage. So you see that for TCF three and four device, we have the highest current density and the fill factor. Uh, you know, if you look at the Y axis and the, for the green, you know, solid line and the dotted lines. So the dotted lines is basically from the simulation that I make and also the, uh, the the experimental values are here so the green solid and the and the dotted lines perform the highest which means that the tcf4 is the one that is best performing device and also when we measure the quantum efficiency curves with both experimental and simulation we have the highest saturation at this particular point close to 90 percent so which means that all the all the incident light when it is falling on the device uh, you know we the 90 percent of that is being uh, you know absorbed and uh, you know we have the electron hole pair generation so this the the highest reported uh, quantum efficiency curve which is industrially made for such amorphous silicon based devices are 90 percent and so we, we we clearly show here that um, you know with very very simple fabrication process and then very new with elimination of a lot of uh, hazardous materials we are still able to get a quantum efficiency curve of close to 90 percent so thereby giving us a conclusion that so in the process i showed you that we use mol molybdenum oxide on top of amorphous silicon thereby making the molybdenum oxide as a, a very effective electron blocking, blocking layer thereby avoiding the recombination of the interface and it not only avoids the recombination but it also increases the conductivity of the of the carbon tubes so I already mentioned this point that the junction recombination is reduced and we have a better PI interface and TCF4 device shows the best performance. And then what we do is we take this TCF4 device and then and at the rear side of it, we have a mirror, uh, which we just place a mirror. And then we again shine the light from the top side and we see that with the mirror, we have much higher current density again and also much higher quantum efficiency uh, improvement which is much more wider in its IR response and the reflecting back mirror in DCF what it does basically is all the incident light which is transmitted through the other side of the device is reflected back again into the device and thereby the absorption increases in the intrinsic absorber layer and we are able to now increase from we, we steadily move from 1.6% to 3.4% to nearly 9% uh, you know, uh, conversion efficiency uh, and this is the highest performing efficiencies, I mean device performance for any such kind of uh, uh, you know, hybrid heterostructure devices and when we compare, compare the performance, look at the parameters which is basically the open circuit voltage, the current density, fill factor and efficiency and we map, I mean, we look at TCF 1, 2, 3, 4, and we also have a reference device, which means that this is industrial process architecture, which is without the carbon nanotubes and with only the ITO and the boron doped amorphous silicon in the reference amorphous silicon device. And we see that the TCF 4 with the mirror tends to fare much better in its efficiency. It has very high fill factor and uh, the, the uh, close to 70% uh, and the current density is almost equal to the shock equalizer limit which is the similar which is the computation uh, theoretical limits for uh, single junction uh, semi, uh, you know the semiconductor pn junction devices and the current density is 
very high, close to 15 uh, milliamp per square centimeter. The open circuit voltage is nearly one volt, so which is very, very high. But when we compare the TCF4 mirror with the reference, we see that in all the parameters, the TCF4 with the mirror performs much better. And we have a nearly 16% increase in the device performance when compared to the standard reference device is mentioned here as the standard device. So here I showed you a very fantastic journey uh, which uh, we started in 2016 with an, uh, with an output of about 1.6% to nearly 9% stable efficiencies and this has been really challenging but it's also been very wonderful to work with. So all these while I have been mentioning that the carbon tubes are a, are a potential replacements for ITO and they are the strongest competitors in today's world and industry has also taken up. I mean, we have a start, we have an offset startup company out of this called as Kanatu, which is based in Finland, uh, where we fabricate these uh, devices and it's, we already are supplying to a lot of automobile industries and uh, Nokia, if you remember Nokia, which happened to be in Finland, so now which Microsoft has taken it, so Microsoft has now taken this up as a technology transfer in their production lines. And uh, we look at it that in when we start when in 2011 it was 84 ohm per square, and then in 2014 the equivalent shift resistance moved to 65 ohm per square, and then in 2017 it was 42 ohm per square, and then in 2019 we have 17 ohm per square. As I showed you, so what is important is this box in the shaded range, and what we desire is keeping a transmittance of between 80 to 90 percent and probably greater than 90 percent. We want to move towards the left hand side wherein the sheet resistance decreases and we are very close to you know even even one ohm per square if, if it is realistically possible but then it is really challenging. So to conclude, so this was the first quantitative study that we made on adhesion of carbon and tube thin films on various materials and this is a direct technology transfer for roll to roll productions. And the, uh, we, we understood that the carbon nanotube addition depends on the atmospheric condition and surface functionalization. We also understood that the uh, uh, conductive polymer and carbon nanotube composites are much more effective than individually when they are applied. And we, uh, we showed that we have a highly efficient P-type transparent conductive film with a record uh, you know, sheet resistance of 17 ohm per square at 90%. And we have a record performance for such hybrid devices at 9%. And the fibers which I have showed you are a potential replacement for these traditional metal contacts. And uh, well, this, these are some of the conclusions, but when you look at the challenges, um, the, the conductivity and transparency are some of the issues that we are still continuing to work with, which the, which the whole community of carbon nanotubes continue to work with the Fermi level, uh, you know, engineering, and then the surface roughness issues of this on the adhesion and then the encapsulation mechanisms, uh, because, you know, oxygen is one of the main dopants for carbon nanotubes for it to be a P type. And then what's important also is we have a semi-metallic carbon nanotube, which means we have nearly one third of our, uh, you know, thin carbon nanotubes, which is metallic, and the rest is two third is semiconductor. And one of the approaches which was recently showed in science, uh, you know, just last year, and they happen to be our collaborators, uh, is also uh, in, the, in the alignment of these carbon nanotubes. I showed you a randomly oriented network, but if you are able to align it in a specific unidirectional way, probably we can get rid of a lot of, uh, you know, the, the junction resistance. And th that's what is being showed here. And uh, to, to finally, so this is the, after the future look, I mean, I just want to acknowledge uh, my, my, my uh, uh, you know, colleagues, uh, Albert and Peter, and uh, my colleagues in uh, German Aerospace Center, and Talent Tech and all my presenter former colleagues in Micronova, Skultech, Alto, Germany and the TUT and the funding agencies. And finally, thank you very much for your attention. I hope I have been on time and uh, I would uh, welcome for questions and for the discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pramod. You did a wonderful uh, You delivered very good uh, talk on this uh, hetero structure for solar cell application. Uh, you Thank you very much. You, have, you carried very good work and you published very good journal. So congratulations. And Thank you very much. I have some question. Yeah. Is there any degradation effect in your solar cell? Uh, 
uh, we exposed our devices for 2000 hours continuous exposure under uh, one sun which is 1000 watt per square centimeter and we see that up to 2000 hours it is stable but after 2000 hours the efficiency reduces by nearly 40 percent so it, it decreases from nine percent to nearly about you know 5.8 to 6 percent so it's between 5.5 and 6 that's what and that's mainly because not because I think I and that's mainly because of this conductive polymer, uh, which is the P.PSS, which tends to be not so stable under air and under exposure to sun. And what we and that's why the challenges and the future outlook I mentioned that encapsulation of the device and also the PMMA that we use in our device is also a polymer, non-conductive polymer, which uh, could be used for organic devices. But I think it's important to find an alternative like the way we have done in silicon technology uh, silicon nitride and silicon dioxide uh, which are much more stable and much more industrially compat compatible and i think we need to find an encapsulation which is much more stable in air so that's the, these are the two challenges rather than the solar cell application can we use this uh, heterostructure nanomaterial for any other uh... Yes, it can. We are already now using it in uh, transistors. We are now using it also. I mean, the carbon. One of the areas of our research in my group in Skultech in MIT Skultech is also also on uh, sensors. Uh, carbon nanotube based sensors are also very very uh, important. And as a carry forward of uh, my research, now we are using these composites for sensors uh, for transistors. Um, and also for a lot of electrochemical purposes and energy storage purposes. So uh, the, this is what I can tell you about the moment. Yeah. Okay, okay. Akshay. And also fi fiber lasers. Fiber lasers is something I forgot to mention that we, we are also working on the fiber lasers part. And we have, I have my colleagues who are continuing to work as a carry forward of this uh, of this output uh, research into this uh, different applications. Yeah. Good, good, good. Uh, Akshay. Hello. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Dr. Pramod M. Rajana. Uh, it looks like we have a few questions from the participants. Yeah, uh, sure. Om Prakash. Okay, Om Prakash, over to you. Thank you, Akshay. Uh, sir, uh, there is one question. Is it possible to enhance the efficiency of uh, uh, single wall uh, carbon nanotubes for uh, solar cell uh, storage applications? Yes, it is possible. I mean, for single wall, I mean, uh, there are two things. So in energy storage devices, you mainly use it as an electrode. Uh, and for that, what is important is you play, what doesn't matter to the energy storage is the optical properties, but more the electrical properties. So what can be basically done is what I mentioned, I showed you also in my work is by chemical doping. So we use chlorauric acid, which is a wet chemical doping. Um, but there are other approaches also which can be taken like, you know, uh, you, know you can dope it in situ doping during the synthesis of the material. Like, us, I mean, it is very much unlike, unlike in silicon, the way you have a substitution and interstitial doping here, what you have is all the carbon atoms are on the surface. And when you dope it, there is a, a intermolecular interaction by which there is, uh, you know, electron, uh, electron transfer. And that's, that, that is how you actually are enhancing the conductivity. And I think um, we are still continuing to work. As I mentioned, we have now come to 17 ohm per square, but we want to move further down to one ohm to two ohm per square. And this can definitely be done by different approaches, as I showed you. And align carbon nanotubes just happen to be one among them. Yeah. Sir, uh, have you made any attempts of uh, making plasmonics on top of the uh, solar cells? Uh, uh, not in this work. Yes, but it is definitely possible. And I have uh, another PhD student who is working on that with my former uh, workplace. And I am kind of an external supervisor for him. That's, that's his whole PhD work, yeah. OK. Sir, uh, one more question from Gurumurthy. Uh, is, uh, is, uh, is it challenging to ensure the uniform dispersion of fillers in the flexible matrix? So how did you produce? So what we made is uh, we, we we first placed these polyimide substrates on uh, rigid substrate, right? And then we have these. Uh, so it's very similar to what is there in a PCB manufacturing unit. So you have these roll-to-roll -roll production wherein you have these very tiny narrow uh, you know tubes, 
and that runs through the whole machine and you have the rollers so this standby but the rollers just move and then you have uh, back and forth you have the uniform coating that's how we did it. so it's very similar to the spin coating this is an in-house developed but now we have purchased the machine uh, but first approach with uh, what i showed you was with the spin coating because the given area of the devices here was up to two square centimeter but then when we go on a larger area let's say for example in real-time industrial applications we are looking at about one square meter in such cases with the roll-to-roll -roll production so as i mentioned to you you have these continuous uh, you know fillers and it's very similar to what is there what happens you have these rolls that move very at a specific uh, speed and then you have the uniform coating so that's how it can be done so we uh, we had at lower areas we approached with spin coating and at larger areas we approached with this roll to roll production sir is there any uh, 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 that's it sir thank you for yeah, yeah. And also what I have to mention to you is what is critical here is uh, the, the, the concentration of, uh, you know, uh, the, the P.PSS that you use. I mean, it can, it need not be P.PSS, it can be any conductive polymer. Uh, but what is very important is to uh, find the optimum, optimum uh, content at which you need to spin for. Uh, I mean, there are different parameters like speed, time, and temperature, I mean, all these things play a specific role. Yeah, but these are, it's definitely possible. And how we approached in our work was, first we tried to fix the content, then we fixed with the speed and then the time. So that's how we were able to produce the thickness. So and our thickness, if I, if I can just quickly show you the cross section, uh, let me just quickly show you the, quickly show you the cross section, how it looks like. Are you still able to see my presentation? Yeah. Okay, let me just quickly show you. So yeah, so here you see we this was in an uh, this was this is the cross section how it looks like. So uh, what you see on the top is very low concentrate uh, content of the you know polymer because of which in the starting work we had we did not have much higher device performance because the conductivity of this whole comp carbon body uh, P.PSS composite was still very high. That's very low, but while when we optimized it, so this is how it actually looks like. So after the optimization, this is a device with about 9% efficiency. This is how it looks like. And when you see on the surface, yeah, I, I unfortunately do not have this surface morphology shot, but I think I showed you in my presentation how it looks like you have these carbon nanotubes which are fully filled, but then when you look at the side, you still have these carbon nanotube polymer uh, stack which is very very well uniformly coated so as you can see here so is this clear to you so the thickness of the carbon nanotube here is about 20 nanometer but the whole stack of p.pss and carbon nanotube is between 55 to 62 nanometers sir last one question is there sir uh, yeah. from sachin lobo uh, the yeah. Uh, what is the maximum power uh, you co uh, could be produced around 45 degrees of uh, sun angle, especially for a polar region like Ireland? So uh, with these kind of devices, the maximum output uh, in, uh, in with a latitude of 45 degrees, because again, um, you know, the, the what matters in a, in a power plant engineering is at what angle do you lay it? And the angle is directly proportional to the latitude of that particular region. For a country in, in, the, in the Scandinavian regions where even the island falls, uh, the maximum power that it can yield is close to about, uh, with, a, with the area of one square meter, this could be about close to one to 1 1.5 watt per square meter. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, it's looked like we have covered all of our questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pramod. We appreciate you being here. Thanks again for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Naveen. And uh, thank you very much, Akshay, for uh, giving me an invitation. And uh, luckily, I happen to be in India at this point of time. And it was really nice to uh, be a participant and, you know, uh, you know, contribute uh, towards this uh, conference. 
and i really wish you the best and uh, we will keep in touch as uh, i mean as i think navin already has my contact details yeah thank you very much yeah yeah thank you very much yeah okay thank you sir now we will move to the second invited talk of this session uh, dr b hema kumar will deliver this talk he is also there here uh, dr yes, b hema kumar is an assistant professor from department of electronics and instrumentation engineering puducherry technological university formerly known as pondicherry engineering college india he obtained his phd in biomedical image processing from Pondicherry University in 2017 he has published papers in 20 international journals and conference he has trained more than 700 teachers on the usage of ICT tools for education and delivered over 25 technical and practical workshop to students all over india his research interest include medical image processing biosignal processing medical instrumentation design and education research so once again dear participants If you have any queries and questions, I if you put it into the chat box in your YouTube control panel. Now I request Professor Navin Kumar S K to continue the session chair. Welcome, uh, Dr. Ram Kumar. Yes, sir. Good morning. Good afternoon. And the talk, uh, and the session has biosensors and Internet of Things in variable health application, healthcare application. i think this is the boom field and advanced field i think this uh, your uh, talk may be helpful for the young, young researchers and those wanted to carry research on uh, flexible electronics using iot related things yes so, uh, over to you huh? thank you thank you sir a very good afternoon uh, almost uh, good morning okay to one and all present over here it's a great opportunity to be among you people on this day so i'm going to just uh, i'm basically a signal specialist okay who work with the signals who make um, uh, extract useful information from the signals transmit those signals that's the kind of work that normally we do okay i'm myself dr b ama kumar from puducherry technological university uh, thanks akshay and navin sir for giving the introduction so basically this uh, field as you told it's a, a kind of booming field uh, where we have a lot of wearable devices nowadays uh, used okay so these wearable devices will be very much uh, it is actually benefiting the customers the users as well as uh because of the advent of biosensors and the iot technologies the amalgamation of these two this it has gone to greater heights okay this kind of technologies okay so all of you might be using uh, uh, a mi phone uh, sorry uh, mi watch i'm actually personally using an mi watch okay mi um, mobile device okay so which actually monitors my heart rate my uh, pulse it also gives me uh, my sleep patterns okay so uh, that's the kind of technology now we try to interact with the internet okay that's the purpose of this particular interaction so uh, coming to the learning outcomes so i'm i will be just interacting with you about uh, the overview of the challenges in wearable sensors okay so what are the wearable sensors and what are the challenges that are available and uh, particularly we are going to see about uh, the technology behind a smart bandage system w what how it is implemented okay the technology and uh, being a signal specialist i concentrate more on how to extract the signal 
and how to make this signal usable how to interpret the signal so that is my area of domain okay so we are also i am also exploring some case studies on iot based wearable technologies and uh, i am also going to show you a small demonstration how to do a data sharing because the current trend for uh, wearable devices is the wearable devices should communicate with the cloud a data sharing between the cloud and the iot devices how the data sharing is taking place we are going to see a simple demonstration okay so that's how my uh, today's interaction is oriented towards okay so first we'll see a uh, overview of the iot system so this is the top area of the current uh, market so it's uh, iot device using for the health care iot is particularly for health care if you happen to see the health care iot uh, particularly uh, we have good number of sensors okay which acquire the data from the users okay the patients they acquire the data and these actually they can be smart sensors as uh, pramod sir uh, mentioned uh, on in the previous talk about the usage of carbon nanotubes uh, we have good number of sensors that are actually fabricated with uh, carbon nanotube and uh, silver gel materials okay so these data acquired from the patient will give you the detail about the patients it may be a sleep it may be a heart rate it may be a pulse it may be a um, um, saturation level of oxygen okay all these data are fed into the cloud okay from the cloud we do uh, the processing the processing of the data extract useful information from the signal like uh, signatures uh we will be extracting a uh, lot of uh, uh, data analysis okay and the ultimately the information will also uh, give it to the physicians okay the physicians will be helpful in making up the system they will be identifying what are the anomalies what are the arrhythmias what are the problems based on that they will be able to provide a solution also we will uh, give a benefit to the users and caregivers or acknowledge with the status of the particular uh, vital parameters or what is the state okay that's how this uh, health care iot works okay now um we are going to see a small interaction actually i can see all the participants uh, from the i can see all of them from the youtube i just want you to interact with me i'm just presenting you so all of us are using wearable technologies all of us are very much fond of these wearable technologies according to you what are the challenges in the wearable technologies so for this i i want you people to log in into a website called menti.com i have given a code on the top 8595594 i have given a code on the top 8595594 use the code to give your answers so i just i want to know what are we will be using wearable technologies okay watches okay fitbits lot of wearable technologies we are already using but they don't have a interaction with iot okay now i am asking you what are the typical challenges when we go for these wearable technologies what you looking for okay so i want you people to uh, look in uh, this particular uh, menti.com just give your views 8595594 uh, i just want you to uh, type in this particular uh, code i just uh, type it in your chat window also i can't type it so just if you can just type in this code can you tell uh, interact with me is it possible uh, akshay can you just transfer this code to the participants uh, tell them to uh, go into menti.com and use the code okay sir please yeah 
please uh, you can start giving your answers what do you think as a uh, typical challenges in the wearable technologies at least i expect a single answer you can just log in into this particular domain and you can give your view what do you think is the challenge uh, when you go for a wearable technology what is that you look for what are the typical challenges in wearable technologies okay we have um, one answer here the good thing about this menti is you not know that who is answering but we'll just know what are the things okay miniaturization good power consumption okay there are a lot more factors we'll just discuss uh, some of the factors that are critically important okay so the typical challenges as you told uh, is low cost technology definitely cost is a very very important factor okay battery life excellent okay we have uh, bio friendly material good excellent bio resistance miniaturization flexibility of course flexibility is very much required okay so battery life is also another concern okay so these are all uh, different uh, views okay excellent thank you thank you friends for uh, giving your views I, i can see more people are give bio resistance okay excellent bio friendly material okay good okay so that's the kind of thing i i, I require okay we have still more answers privacy excellent point bio compatibility good time delay fine okay um costly it's excellent costly factor of the cost not trustworthy exactly how much trustworthy how much we can trust upon these devices fine okay thank you friends uh, you can still give your views i'll just come back to this so the first and foremost is the low cost so as far as low cost is concerned uh, there are many factors that actually come into this cost one is about the sensor and what is the kind of sensor that is used what is the power consumption of the sensor okay so all these factors come inside your low cost technology second thing is uh, interoperability and expandability that's what many people have told about flexibility okay so interoperability is actually about uh, it should be suited for a variety of platforms suppose normally we use this mi band so which can communicate with uh, your mobile device okay so it is a small range via bluetooth when we talk about interoperability it can be over a wide platform it can be via zigbee it can be a http protocol it can be via your internet okay it should be operable over the thing so currently most of the devices that have been developed they are uh, very specific they are very specific to that particular area or application specific okay we need to explore of uh, expanding this one and expandability of our solution it is like we don't normally purchase a device which is suited only for one particular application suppose they sell the same mi watch only for heart rate and uh, sleep pattern very pe- less people will buy the product okay so i i'm seeing more answers safety security okay thank you thank you so uh, but what happens is that this device is also coupled with a mobile phone wherein i can receive calls and the function so it is as far as people buy a product it depends upon multiple functions so expandability of the overall solution okay so instead of serving as a single point you need to expand it okay that's the second factor well said third factor as you all know you get abundant data okay the data that you get from the system is going to be abundant okay how we are going to process this information okay how to process this information and come out with some useful information 
For that, you require a machine learning algorithms. So these factors, these are also factors which, which is a really challenging part of the thing. And last factor, as everyone has mentioned, the security factor. How far my data is secure? Okay. When I share my personal data, how far it is secure? Okay. Normally, whenever uh, we go for sharing of medical data, it has to be um, it, it has to be under strict privacy protocols, and it should be with the consent of the user. It should be with the consent of the user. The data has to be shared. Okay. So these are all some of the typical challenges for wearable sensors. Okay. So here I'm actually giving you uh, certain examples where uh, we're going to talk about. Okay. Uh, you can see this girl uh, with uh, helmet, helmet kind of thing. Can you tell what is this uh, thing? Can you guess guess what is this? You can type in your chat window. Uh, what is the kind of uh, uh, device it's actually? What's the type? Okay, size and weight. Many have mentioned in the comment itself. Okay. So I'm asking you. Uh, okay, fine. So this is a kind of helmet. This is a kind of helmet. Uh, if you actually see, it actually uh, identifies the mood. If the person is in a depression kind of thing, it will be able to rejuvenate the person. That's the kind of. So see the technology that is going. That is to aid the personal and it is going to be give a personal experience. Okay. And uh, the thing that we are going to see today is um, this particular interesting factor. It's called as a smart bandage. Okay. Something, uh, okay, everyone know what's a bandage, right? So whenever uh, we have a wound or something, we are going to use a bandage, okay? So what is the purpose of the bandage? The bandage serves a purpose like uh, it is going to, uh, okay, so the bandage, uh, basically, if you have your bandage, it's basically, it's going to uh, prevent the wound from uh, spreading okay and it serves as a barrier okay and most common problem with our bandages at particular even though the wound is a very big one after the wound is getting healed okay that particular region will have uh, that sensation of itching that will be a very very uh, difficult phase to cross okay now now we are going to talk about a smart bandage so smart bandage is something which is a wearable, which is not going to cause any difficulty. And it is going to monitor the status of the wound. It is going to give you real time updates. And the drug delivery is also via a diffusion process. Okay, that's the interesting thing about the smart bandage. So these are the components of the smart bandage. Okay, it has a temperature sensor which is going to sense the temperature uh, from the person. It has a drug delivery pump. Although this is a drug delivery pump, it is a manual pump. It's a manual pump, which is going to act. And uh, whenever you give a pressure, it is going to release a drug. But the mechanism by which it is released is called as a drug diffusion method. It is by a drug diffusion method. It is released. Okay. You have a touch sensor, which is going to, uh, uh, which actually serves uh, for the input. Okay, whenever you give an input, uh, whenever you press it, uh, that will be uh, reactivated. Okay, that will be actually reactivate your functioning. And you have a wireless coil. The coil actually serves two purposes. One is for powering up. And second one is for transmitting the signal. It is either for powering as well as transmitting the signal. It is uh, twofold purpose. Okay. So that's all the components of the smart bandage. So coming to the temperature sensor, as uh, Pramod sir told, uh, we are, uh, it is using a carbon nanotube ink, mainly for uh, whenever you have medical applications, the most preferred material for your uh, recording of bio signals will be a silver material. Okay. So this carbon nanotube, is mixed with signal, uh, silver. That is the most prominent type of uh, sensor. And uh, this is basically a, a sensor, uh, as uh, Sat told, it is it is using PDOT PSS. Okay, it is PDOT PSS. 
actually the technology of pdot pss actually amazes me okay uh, that is conductive uh, plastics it's a category of conductive plastics where we use uh, uh, by the technology of electron hopping you might be knowing what is an electron hopping so using that uh, we are having conductive plastics so these two are mixed uh, carbon nanotubing and a silver ink or a gel are mixed together and they are cured for 70 degree centigrade and it is used okay so particularly this is an printed temperature sensor you can see this is a shadow printing of a temperature sensor and it is having um, uh, with uh, on the pdot okay so it offers a good sensitivity of uh, minus around 0.78 percentage per degree centigrade okay and the resolution and also um, to detect a change in the temperature that is via illness whenever you want to detect an illness they it is around point the temperature resolution should be at least 0.01 degree centigrade to identify this okay that's the kind of temperature sensor that is employed also we have a heart rate sensor this is an heart rate sensor again this is using cnt and silver nanoparticles okay with the ratio of 5 to 3 weight ratio so basically it's a strain sensor so strain is nothing but a force okay force or a pressure okay so here we use um, a mechanism for resistance okay basically it's you can uh, think of a strain as a wire so whenever uh, it will be so sensitive to the heart beats whenever uh, it senses the heart beat it undergoes flexion okay that will actually change its resistance this will be used as a strain sensor for heart beat measurement okay and the third mechanism that actually um, interests me a lot is this wireless detection okay so see this kind of wireless detection that is used in uh, these devices you have two coils actually so one is a transmitting coil and a receiving coil you can see the circuit here okay you have a capacitance connected in series with the two coils so whenever a person touches on the capacitance whenever he touches the capacitance and the inductance changes okay the change is actually uh, is reflected as a frequency change when your capacitance and your inductance change it is a frequency change this frequency change it's going to actually uh, in terms of frequency change we can tell it as resonant frequency change it's more dominant around 42 megahertz there will be a resonant frequency change and amplitude change that will be detected as a change that will be transmitted outside okay so that's how your wireless detection serves its purpose it actually backs up the power supply required for the operation as well as for the transmission purpose fine and the last part of that thing is a drug delivery okay so you have a, a small reservoir of that particular uh, drug so whenever you press it it just goes in via a diffusion mechanism it's a diffusion uh, drug okay. when i actually uh, remember this diffusion drug uh, initially it has been used for uh, the most popular diffusion kind of uh, thing is for drug delivery mainly for insulin okay insulin uh, for patient delivery with insulin we use this kind of uh, okay excellent many have, i have not seen the chat window sorry so mood analysis emotion recognition thank you friends sachin and pratima bart okay fine uh, back to the thing so insulin uh, insulin for uh, drug delivery for uh, diabetes patients diabetes patient okay so basically it is uh, fabricated out of elastomer uh, of uh, polydimethyl silane uh, siloxane okay typically if you see a normal gentle human touch will be around 3.3 kilopascals the pressure is around 3.3 kilopascals for a gentle normal touch okay so this uh, touch will actually infuse the drug into the patient via diffusion mechanism okay so this is all about the components of your system so this is a typical response that you get from that uh, sensor temperature sensor you can see this actually we are recorded for two cases This is the first case and this is the second case. First case is when the person is taking a spicy soup. 
we all know that what happens when you take a spicy soup to compensate for the temperature a uh, body automatically increases its uh, temperature okay so you can see the stripe elevation the temperature around 33 degrees centigrade okay so that's the case for uh, when a person takes up a spicy soup okay and this is a person exercising this is for a, a short duration of 12 minutes for a recorded for a 12 minutes here there is not appreciable increase in the temperature okay so this is the response of the uh, sensor temperature sensor that and touch sensor that we get uh, from these kind of uh, uh, smart bandage systems fine so so far we have seen about the interaction okay uh, apart from these uh, we have seen as far as the smart bandage is concerned we looked into a temperature measurement we looked into a heartbeat measurement we saw about uh, drug delivery okay these are the and apart from this you have good amount of wearable sensor that are currently in use okay so this is we have seen already heart rate and we have blood pressure blood pressure blood glucose okay um just for knowing um can you tell what is the blood pressure of human beings i just want to type it into the chat window uh what is the okay temperature sensitivity uh, per degree change what is the percentage change for a degree centigrade temperature that's called as sensitivity how far my device is uh, sensitive that's called as temperature sensitivity so uh, our normal blood pressure is 120 bar 80 okay so you have the respiration rate oxygen saturation temperature skin these are some of the parameters and the type of sensor that are used for uh, recording these devices okay mostly i am uh, will be i will be discussing about macro scale sensors okay okay now uh, i'm going into i'm going to present a very interesting uh, technology that is this uh, ict uh, that is usage of iot tools usage of iot tools particularly for elderly people particularly for elderly infants okay so we going to see some uh, simple case studies we'll see just okay uh, i'm having a interesting statistics from lpage international it's an uh, international organization for ngo for uh, welfare of the uh, elderly these are the health challenges so elderly older people uh, and infants elderly older people and infants they have a very interesting statistics that by 2050 nearly 1 in 5 people in developing countries will be over the age of 60 okay by this is a very interesting statistic by 2050 nearly 1 in 5 people in developing countries so you can think of more number of aged people okay over the age of 60 okay now so um whenever there's an old age okay it is they will be experiencing lot of challenges okay so i want you to type in what are the challenges typically faced by elderly people typically faced by elderly people okay thank you uh, sasidhar and pratima bard for giving the blood pressure ranges okay so i want you go back to the same menti i want you to go back to the same menti.com um with the same code with the same code uh use the thing i want you to type in there are uh, typical health challenges that are given i want you to rate the health challenges what are the health challenges that are presented over there i need you to rate it okay i need you to rate the health challenge okay you will be able to see it uh, i'm just uh, showing the menti.com okay so use the same code use the same code and try to uh, 
get these details. So I want you to rate the following health challenges that affect the elderly people. Rate the health challenges that affect the elderly people. Okay, sorry. Good. Okay. So as per this, uh, so our four members have given their views. So first uh, is hearing loss. Then we have mental health issues. Third is cardiovascular diseases. Fourth is balance disorders. Okay. Okay. So the thing ch changes actually. So hearing loss, cardiovascular, okay. So first, uh, cardiovascular disorders come into picture. Good. Hearing loss. Excellent. Balance disorders, mental health issues, cognitive impairments. Okay. Okay, so as per the rating of now uh, of 11 members, so cardiovascular, so okay, 12 members. So the peak is cardiovascular diseases. Second one is a hearing loss. Third is a balance disorders. Fourth one is a mental health issues and cognitive impairments. Okay, so we'll come back. Uh, we'll, I'm, I'm just going to show the statistics from LPH International. Okay. Fine. So this, uh, this is the order in which they have given. Okay. So the first is hearing loss. As per uh, the statistics from Health Page International, the most common and the most top one is the hearing loss. Okay. Hearing loss accounts to nearly, um, particularly the age group of, uh, I'll just take a pen. Okay, so particularly in the age group of uh, 65 to 74, uh, one third of the person will have the hearing loss. And above 75 age, one half of the person will have hearing loss. Okay, so that is the severity of this particular problem. Okay, so whenever a person has hearing loss, so will not be able to get well with the uh, uh, particular kind of uh, social environment okay and which actually uh, will cause some kind of social isolation but nowadays uh, good uh, good technologies for health hearing loss uh, smart devices are coming into picture okay so the first among as per the l page international it is hearing loss the second one is cardiovascular diseases so actually, uh, as per the 2016 statistics from WHO, um, uh, roughly around 31% uh, 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 of the death are caused due to cardiovascular device diseases. Of that 31%, percentage, 85% percentage are mainly due to ischemic heart disease. Okay, that is the statistic. So cardiovascular diseases pose a very big threat. Then you have cognitive impairments. So cognitive impairments is about um, the ability to hear, speak, think, okay, 
so these abilities also lower down as you age okay so cognitive impairments then fourth one is mental health issues okay that's about depression anxiety okay so that's mental health issues and lastly balance disorders so the ability to walk okay the sensory motor system how much they are able to respond okay so this is the uh, statistics as per uh, thing okay from our experience uh, it actually changes from what we have experienced okay fine so i'm going to see two technologies available here which covers most of these one particularly first for elderly people elderly people we have this particular kind of uh, thing it's a iot based monitoring system it's called a smart beer it's called a smart beer it is a smart living solution platform for the elderly people it's a smart solution for the elderly people okay so particularly uh, what they tell us that you can just log in into this website and see about this project it's an ongoing project smart beer it is actually pioneered in five cities uh, uh, rome uh, and uh, different greece okay so they actually address heart hearing loss cardiovascular diseases okay and all the mental health all the five problems they address so basically what it has is so this is the architecture of your uh, uh, smart beer you can see we have the patients here on this end we have the patients and these are the caregivers and significant others so caregivers can be the family members or the organization who take care of the patients okay so they can communicate so you have a good amount of patient devices okay uh, starting from simple temperature sensing heart rate sensing hearing sensing you have uh, different devices similarly you have smart home devices okay all these contribute towards a smart beer home up we have a up okay which is going to amalgamate all the information from the devices okay these are then transmitted to the cloud so you have a smart beer cloud okay this smart beer cloud collects the data from your real time uh, sensors and from the system from the up it collects the data and the very beauty about this particular cloud is it has a good amount of data analytics okay so based on the information from the caregivers based on the information from the patients it will be delivering personalized interventions it will be able to give personalized intervention to the users that is the advantage okay by using machine learning algorithms it will be able to give a personalized intervention also it is going to be associated with the hospitals okay so which as the expertise knowledge of the clinicians thereby it will be helping the patients to overcome these kind of difficulties okay it will monitor the status it will serve as a companion it will give them real time uh, visualization of the thing so it will be giving uh, sufficient alarms and warnings to the caregivers about the status of the patients okay so that's the kind of system that is smart beer actually this smart beer is built on evotion platform you can just uh, see this particular website uh, h2020evotion.eu uh, actually uh, currently it is been used for uh, five hospitals in greece actually this is using this particular uh, evotion platform okay where they collect a uh, good amount of medical physiological and lifestyle data from uh, heterogeneous resources sensors and based on that they provide uh, personal interventions for these patients okay and uh, currently the project is being tested and validated through six uh, particular uh, six different countries okay france greece italy spain romania and portugal okay so these are the uh, you can just go into the website of the smart beer okay and you can uh, explore more about this project and they have a special smart beer consortium Uh, there also they have a discussion kind of thing fine and the second interesting application for iot we are going to see is called as ellipsis okay 
it's an in intelligent invasive uh, non invasive for non invasive bio signal recording system for infants okay so this particular project is mainly for uh, detecting the infants so normally uh, babies will have lot of problems um to monitor the status of the babies they use this kind of smart bed mattress basically the smart bed mattress it contains a high resolution video camera so high resolution video camera to monitor the baby it also has an audio recording high quality microphone to record it has a balisto cardiogram balisto cardiogram to record the um heart rate and other parameters ecg related to conditions okay it also has a temperature and uh, humidity sensors okay humidity sensor which monitor the patient sleep okay the so most uh, problematic whenever uh, for a pediatrician is they have to interpret something only based on the doctors the patients that is the parents input they can only respond based on the parents input okay here we are trying to see a system wherein the doctors can get more information about the uh, babies without disturbing their sleep okay so even uh, this device this particular system has an um, uh, mobile device wherein the parents will be alerted with specific conditions about the patient okay this is a entirely system that is governed with infants this is a system that is governed with infants okay now we'll go into the interesting part of our session uh, we're going to see a simple demo okay so this is a system this is a system um this is how your wearable technologies communicate wearable technologies communicate with the iot or the cloud with the cloud okay so these are the different devices by which you can uh, obtain the data either you can use a arduino or a data acquisition device okay so here we are going to tell about this platform labview and actually i am going to concentrate only on this region so after the sensor data is there how to use your labview labview is a software which you can use it for uh, visualization you can go for deployment stage up to a deployment stage we are going to communicate the data to a cloud okay so via http protocol via http protocol we are going to communicate the data to the firebase cloud firebase is a google cloud firebase is a google cloud we are going to show you how to use the google cloud and how to share the data with the cloud and how to receive the data okay again this is you can use it along with uh, mit app inventor also which i am not going to show you and see the format of data the format of the data is json json is a format it's a string type of data okay that's the data format that we are going to use to transmit data we we'll see it now okay i'm just going to show you um so uh, i'm going to use labview i'm going to use labview so before i use labview i'm just going to take you into the cloud system so this is the firebase cloud it's a google cloud it's a firebase google cloud you need to log in with your uh, account with your google account you can log in i'm just going to the console is a firebase console already i have created a project we can create a new project so here you have your firebase projects and creating a new project so i just go uh, press webinar i just put it as webinar some name for the data okay i'm just giving a name for the data project okay so i'm just creating a small project okay so a project is getting created 
it'll take few seconds depending upon our um, it'll take a few second to create that particular uh, thing in the time i'll just open up uh, lab view so this is a lab view okay i've already uh, created it but uh, let me explain you what are the things that are available actually i'm going for data communication so when i right click so in your lab view you have two panels one is a front panel and another one is a block panel to put it simple front panel is like the front of your instrument you take any instrument for your recording so the front panel is something like the front of the instrument block diagram is like the internal part of your working suppose you to say a very simple one addition of two numbers so your front panel will display only the addition part the display the two input numbers the internal block diagram will tell you about how it all joins together okay so here i am going to use a protocol called http so that uh, when i right click i have data communication under protocols i choose http client okay so this is the protocol i am going to use it i'll use uh, http protocol okay so this is the protocol i am going to use so whenever i want to initiate the response i have to use uh, open handle i have to use open handle that is, that will be actually initiating our mechanism to send a data into the cloud we have to use the command put okay the command to be used is put you can see in put you need to give the url where you send the data then you need to give the input data okay input data this is a converter this will actually convert your data to json and you have a close handler i'm just uh, adding a while loop for this control a simple while loop okay now we need to go back to the firebase okay the firebase is started now now i'll just go to see on the develop side i have real time database i'll just go to the real time database so i'm just want to create a new database so i'll create a new database there are two modes in which you can create a database you have lock mode and test mode lock mode is most private okay so i go for test mode just for checking it is public data when i move in test mode it is public i go in test mode so this is the address of my um, thing okay this address i need to copy it this address i'll just copy it this is my cloud address okay so i'll come back to my uh, cloud uh, my thing here you have this address okay i'll just paste the address that i have copied there it is a webinar and uh, it has to be data in json okay data dot json plus what i do is that this is a cluster cluster is basically a mixture of different datas so this is a, say arithmetic data this is a, say a, a boolean data this is a say a string data a uh, mixture of these two three is called as a cluster okay i am trying to add some data say i'll just add a sensor value of say 67 i'm giving a boolean data so some calibration data e123 something okay now i want to transmit this data to the uh, cloud so okay now we can see the data is uh, in the real time whatever data i have sent okay you can see the data that i have sent from this particular platform okay you can see the data here also the data handling is also shown here the same data is getting transmitted to your cloud you can see this is a simple application i'm showing it's a public cloud public data i'm showing a public data okay so anyone can use this address and uh, access this data okay this is how you use a uh, simple cloud for uh, sending the data from your uh, so this can be any data so i am just showing it for a simple uh, cluster 
you can use it for any data physical data that you have okay suppose you take any signal once you take it once you extract the useful parameters from the signal it is going to be a series of numbers okay that a series of data can be sent to the cloud okay so this is how you send the data to the cloud i will just show you how to receive the data from the cloud just a uh, opposite of this i'm just going to open the receive part so in receive part uh the receive part you can see the same thing instead of put i'm going to use get instead of put it is get okay so i need to change the address i need to change the address where i am going to retrieve the data okay so it will be in json format i'll just convert the json data cluster data and i'll be presenting the data on the pc here okay so i'll just run you should be able to see the sensor value and uh, okay so that's the data that is retrieved from the cloud you can see the data so the boolean status the calibration data i can change the value from here say i just give 67 uh, or some other data 375 okay i give uh, i e okay i have to press enter to change the data okay so now it should be reflecting on your uh, mobile pc okay so that's how you can simply transmit data via the cloud uh, communication via the cloud okay i'm just demonstrating only the lab view part from the lab view i'm sending the data to the cloud the second example i just received the data from the cloud and displayed okay so the processing part suppose uh, you can do it in the cloud itself or you can do it in your system from the remote end okay so this is how uh, we can exchange data via the cloud by using this software platform called labview okay so back to the presentation okay so the last part of our session it's about uh, how to use these kind of wearable tech for covid 19 particularly for covid 19 okay so these are some of the current wearable techs in market many people might be using it okay what is the most popular fitbit fitbit is uh, you know it has basically respiration rate heart rate sensing okay and the one that is new this is go qi go qi is also ha having a spo2 measurement oxygen saturation measurement then you have cora ring uh, which is also now into covid 19 com com identifying the phenomenon so basically cora ring is for sleep pattern studies it is basically for sleep pattern study currently they are also focusing on uh, the kind of uh, health monitoring for covid 19 and this is apple watch all of you know about apple watch the interesting thing about in covid 19 is that they have introduced a watch detection system and detection and watch detection system there will be preset timer for 20 seconds it will detect your motion uh, whether you are washing your hand perfectly or not okay that's an apple watch which does the job and these are all other sensors in the similar field you have uh, medi biosense wearable sensor which records your ecg and other vital parameters and jawbone up sensor is similar to that of your fitbit okay these are some of the sensors which claim to combat covid 19 by identifying the uh, initial pro things okay okay so to conclude so the role of the smart bio sensors and iot is significant in the modern medical system okay it provides the patients care providers okay the health professionals the doctors to come at a better conclusion and uh, provide personal good personal interventions okay because of these kind of systems and uh, mostly when we talk about flexible and variable systems they should be more macro scalable and mainly it should be economically available 
because of the fabrication technology that is available okay so the cost should be reduced dramatically and the commercial viability should be increased in the future okay so that's a great thing about the technology fine okay these are the you can further look into uh, these excellent areas some of the upcoming devices okay and thank you for listening thanks for the opportunity this is my contact number and you have your qr code you can scan it where you get the excellent details about uh, all these details thank you thank you dr kumar yes sir you have done very good uh, research and uh, this is enlightened for the youngsters especially they wanted to do research on uh, this iot related uh, uh, research yes. so we have some questions from the participants later i'll ask some question yes. to om prakash over to om prakash hello hello sir, yes, sir. Uh, we have few questions from the uh, participants yes sir. how can we protect the cnt and uh, ag based uh, printable temperature sensor from physical and chemical damage during application basically it is covered um, by okay basically it is covered by an outer sheath okay it is not as i shown it is not so visible outside okay so it it is protected by hermetic shield but it is sensitive okay the areas where you have uh, sensitive to and uh, those regions are opened up what is the stability of the uh, printed uh, temperature sensor so stability in terms of uh, not able to get it stability. general physical physical stability yeah physical stability okay physical stability as long as uh, for a normal temperature range it is uh, having a very good performance normally as i told uh, the change in temperature is around 0.78 percentage sensitivity is very good it is able to give a better response for uh, uh, normal physical conditions say the examples that we took into this the kind of mechanism for normal exercise okay the kind of output that we got okay so in that way it is good stable but still uh, it should be more regged more regged for to be used in uh, real practical environments real practical environments it has to be more regged than only what is the need for humidity sensor for infant infant treatment ah uh, exactly excellent so humidity is basically um, you know about babies they tend to uh, uh, it's uh, connected with their emotional fear okay so the babies tend to uh, urinate or um, uh, their body perspiration changes okay all these changes will reflect about how far the sleep of the baby is good so all these parameters are important for monitoring the parameters for the sleep okay so some parameters will be more dominant during sleep time that is when the patient is resting okay for those parameters you need to have humidity okay sir yes. thank you thank you very much sir Akshay, over to Akshay. It's a wonderful presentation, sir. Thank you, sir. So I have a question. Please, sir. So how we can use these smart sensor into agriculture application for real time application? Is it possible, sir? yeah definitely possible um agriculture application uh, you have different sectors in that uh, based on suppose you want to plant or monitoring the status of the plant and uh, the humidity conditions inside the plant okay all these factors um, but mostly it will be macro scalable sensors as far as agriculture is concerned it will be mostly macro scalable printed sensors will not be uh, to my preference it will not be much of use in uh, particularly can uh, if you want you can uh, tell your views 
okay thank you sir thank you uh, i think uh, it likes uh, look likes we covered all of our questions yes sir so you did very good uh, research so i would like to do collaboration work with you and also i would like to visit your lab please also, sir. giving invitation to visit my university and my lab yes sir so in fact i would like to do some collaboration work so that we can enhance uh, this kind of work to our uh, researcher so they yes, wanted to do research in this field so thank you dr kumar we thank appreciate you. you being here thanks again for joining us today thank, thank you. you thank you goodness Uh, here uh, we are we are concluding our session for the day uh, for the day and tomorrow we'll continue the second day session at uh, 10:30 am we are signing up for the today thank you all once again thank you